Hello, everybody. How are you? Good to have you here today. Uh, my name is Matt Bays, and this is the gayest I have looked ever. <laughs> ever. Yeah. Ever. My daughter put like a little red rhinestone on my ear here. It's glued to it to give me a little extra something for y'all. So anyway, I, um, I'm excited to be here. I'm going to take a minute to introduce myself and then to kind of walk you through what the plan is for the next 50 minutes. Uh, and then we'll dive right in. Sound good? Okay. So I'm a former worship leader. That is what I did forever. Uh, it started in 1994, did it for 27 years, and the last nine years in uh, those big evangelical churches, you know the kind, and um, uh, really enjoyed a lot of that, but it became a, a time for me where, where it stopped fitting, and so I've moved on that for that from those for obvious reasons, and so honestly, it would be easier for me to like sit here and sing. <laughs> that is my wheelhouse. Uh, the speaking thing is not, but um, here I am. And here you are. So let's do this thing. But uh, when I was in those churches, I, for so many years, was in disguise, you know? Uh, and so not living my authentic self. And so to be able to stand before you today as myself... I just can't even really tell you the amount of gratitude it is intense running through me that I have to be able to be here with you as, as my true self. So I am a dad. I have two daughters. Uh, one of them is here, but she is out on a date, <laughs> which I am not happy about. But she is 22, and that's what they do, I'm told. So, and then my other one is 20. 20 years old, and so, yeah, great, great girls, and excited about that. Love my kitties. And also, I am recently married. I'm a newlywed. I got married, yeah, yeah, I got married, uh, it was three weeks ago yesterday. Is today Saturday? Three weeks ago yesterday on Friday the 13th. There weren't a lot of choices. It was between Friday. The, the venue literally had two dates available, Friday the 13th and September 11th. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I think we made a great decision. Uh, so I'm a writer. Uh, I'm going to get out of this real soon, but this is to get me all started. I'm a writer, and so when I typically speak, every word is important to me as a writer, and usually when I've done this in the past, every single word is memorized, but for the last several years since I came out in 2017, life has sort of been unscripted. So I'm doing a little bit of that today, and I've approached this talk in that same way. So my plan is to share my story with you today and then read a few excerpts from my new book, Leather and Lace is what it's called, Yes, Like the Song, Don Henley, Stevie Nicks. Um, there's a narrative, narrative arc that runs through it that is 80s music, so, you know, knock yourself out. The subtitle is A Gay Man, Lost Love, and a Road Trip with His Dead Sister, which will all be explained. But anyway, um, and, and those books are available in the tent, and I just want to say now, because I'll forget, because I'm, I'm a tish ADD, if, um, if you get a book and you want me to sign it, please come up. Don't think you're going to bug me. Please come up. Let's have a conversation. I'd be happy to sign your book. All right. And I wrote this book in part because I wanted to add to the noise, you know, my voice of what is happening in the LGBTQ uh, plus community. So many great things. And, um, and there isn't a shit ton of literature out there for us, you know, that t people talking about their stories. And, and so it was important to me to be able to take my writing and be able to, to do that. Uh, uh, and, and this book is, please think of it as something not only to read, but to pass on to other gay people, people of faith, but also um, parents or loved ones or whatever that might need to read something that helps people understand. Because not everybody's bad because they're not affirming. You know, a lot of times it's, it's hardwiring. I mean, people have grown up with this stuff. I certainly did. 
And they're, they're doing their best, you know? I always try to think that, that people are doing the best with the tools that they have, the knowledge that they have. But stuff like this might be a nice way for people, people to be able to get some new information and maybe peel back a layer to get them started. Although there's a lot of F-bombs in there, so they might not like that. But thank you to Semler, who has been such a voice here, who has like raised the bar. She cusses all the time. So I feel like I just want to tell her thank you and good company. And I also want to say before I get started here that uh, things are changing uh, in the world. As you can see, they're changing all over the place. And I think uh, these evangelical churches, if you're evangelical, please know that I've been evangelical my whole damn life. So I'm with you, but things are changing. Somebody said sorry. <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. I love you. Um, and, and so with things changing the way that they are, uh, I wanted to be a part of that change. And uh, again, I'm just, I'm honored and so grateful. I mean, I had a moment where I was sitting over on the picnic table before this started with my friend, my good, good, wonderful friend, Laura, who wrote the foreword to this book, who's also a, a writer, and I just got teary-eyed, and I thought, my God, that, that I get to show up this way, I can't really express uh, the honor and the profound a gratitude that I have that I get to show up as my true self, finally. I mean, it's been such a long time coming. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, um, I grew up, my childhood uh, was, a, it was a chaotic home. Uh, abuse of every kind, sexual, physical, all the things. Uh, but we were uh, an evangelical family in an evangelical church that was so conservative. I mean, I felt like I was born in the nursery. You know what I mean? We were there all the time. And so that's sort of how I lived my life. And it, and it was pretty, at a young age, I just began to notice, and not in a way where I, you know, knew at the time. It was just looking back at this little boy. Uh, he was a good boy, by the way. Uh, but seeing uh, other boys, even as early as kindergarten, and just liking their faces more, like Fritz Cornell, that's actually a name, and Heather Kelly, this girl, I knew she was super cute, you know, but I wanted to look at him, do you know what I mean? I wanted to see his face, I wanted to stare at it, which this would be something that I would have to call back to as I was moving through the process of figuring out what it was like to come out, because uh, those were signs for me that there was something else going on. Now, because of the abuse, of course, I just, it was very convenient. It was like a loophole for me to sort of attribute what had happened in my home and in the abuse that, oh, this must be where the wires got crossed, right? That I need to detangle this, uh, which I, can I be completely frank? What if it did? I don't even care, you know, because this is who I am now. I don't think that's what happened, but if at the end of my life, by some miracle, I find out, yep, that's what happened, good for me. You know, I'm glad to be here. This is who I am, whatever. It's all good. But anyway, so my sister is a, a really important figure in my life. Trina is her name. And she was six and a half years older than I was, and she was, when you grow up in a chaotic, and some of you may have this experience, when you grow up in a chaotic childhood, uh, your siblings, a lot of times they feel like war vets, you know, you've gone through that shit together. And it's significant, and she, because she was six and a half years older than me, she was, she was kind of like a, she was like a sister slash, like, almost like a mother, you know, in some way. So she took me everywhere with her, and I thought she was just the coolest person in the world. So whenever she would go to get an eight pack of Pepsi Cola, you remember? She would always say, do you wanna come? And I was like, yes, and in the car we would sing uh, to all the 80s songs, to the late 70s songs, and she was just like a hero to me. And that never changed. You know, as we got older, she was just, she was my person. 
And that's significant because, like I said with the book, the subtitle, uh, A Road Trip with My Dead Sister, uh, because um, she got cancer, breast cancer, in 2007, and it was, um, it was, um, what, what are the levels? A. She was um, just barely A, like type 1A, one, one is it? Why is my brain going crazy right now? You know what I'm saying, barely had it. And so she had a double mastectomy. She got kind of radical with her treatment. And uh, we were like, good with this. You know, like, I'm glad she's doing this. We're ensured that she's going to be here. And right after she uh, passed her five uh, year marker, uh, it just, it returned just like wildfire. I mean, it was everywhere in her body. And that, uh, that was the moment that I knew She'd be leaving me one day. I just didn't know when. You know, I, could, I, I just almost couldn't bear the thought you know, at the time. And so thankfully, I had about three and a half years left with her. Uh, and I made the most of those, those days. So she's a wonderful, wonderful person in my life. And uh, I'll get back to her in a moment. But press on to junior high and high school. If you're sitting out here and you're a person of the LGBTQ plus community, you understand all the things, you know, just the shit show that goes on in your head with this kind of stuff. I got to college, and it was the first time in my life I was ever popular. You know, I was at a small Christian liberal arts college, and uh, I all, had all these, like, I was dating all these girls, but I was also living in the dorm with all of these guys, you know, and while they were busy falling in love with girls, I was busy falling in love with them, you know, uh, really close friends. You're in intimate quarters. You're sharing all kinds of stuff about yourself, and I'm a happy-go-lucky person. If you know Myers-Briggs, I'm an ENFP, so we're going to figure out how to party and have a good time, but that other side of me was just wrecked inside. Like, I didn't know what to do. And I knew that it wasn't, for me, a choice between gay and straight. It was always a choice between straight and hell. And that's significant, because I didn't want to go there. And that's all I could see was a possibility for me if I did. So I never even considered that there was another option. You know, and this is... 1990, 91, you know, and uh, anyway, so I got married and uh, to a really wonderful, compassionate, super talented woman, and part of the reason, in retrospect, this has been hard to figure out, but of why I got married was because I just wanted all this head trash to end, you know, and I really believed if I just got married, you know, that I'd be fine because... You know, I mean, when you're 21, oh shit, am I gonna say this? Everything works. You know what I'm saying? So you kind of think, oh, I'm fine. Maybe I'm bisexual, you know? And so I kind of thought all of that would go away and I would be able to ju just go on my life and forget about all of that. And so that's what I did. I sort of unplugged a portion of myself and uh, from the circuit breaker, you know, or circuit board of my life and lived uh, this straight life and put on the disguise and lived that way all my life. Meanwhile, I'm talking about vulnerability obsessively <laughs> and authenticity. I can't with myself right now. But that's what I did. So uh, I'm going to start into the first excerpt because what happened was when my sister passed away in 2016, and I wasn't prepared for this, but when she did, it, it woke something up in me, that whole life is short thing, you know, and I just thought, I don't, not I can't, I don't have to do this anymore. And there's so much to the story that I won't go into, but uh, I will say this, that when, let me look at my notes here, make sure I'm right on this first track. Um, yeah, that uh, before my sister died, I was able to walk through her, her death with her. I was visiting her constantly and sitting with her. And I wrote this section that I want to share with you now. I forgot that I'm 50. They are magical. 
I hate them and I love them because I never have them for menus at restaurants. So this is a section. This is what I really love to do. I love to write. I don't understand loss. I know that it's part of life. I just don't know why. And I don't understand how it is that we get better, though not all the way. Love is born within us and then recklessly ripped out. C.S. Lewis spoke in universities telling his students that pain was a mag megaphone to rouse a deaf world. But death isn't a megaphone. It's a cruel lullaby, a lament that doesn't rouse or revive. It lulls a part of us to sleep or twists our arms into acceptance. And the world is such an unkind place. Maybe God is too, or is it just me? Several days earlier, Trina called me into her bedroom. Her unwillingness to make preparations had us all believing she was in denial of what was happening. This is about four days before she passed. We wondered if she even understood that she was dying. Sit down, she told me, and I did. Her face was serious, determined, unafraid. I want Steve Carney to do the service, she said, and I want you to plan the music. Just make it nice and do your thing. I watched her. She was calmer than I'd seen her in a long time. This was not a woman in denial. This was a warrior who had chosen to live her final days rather than plan for her death. How could I have underestimated her? Come here, she told me, and I followed her into the closet. This is the dress I want to be buried in. It was the one she'd worn at her wedding, a silver dress with puffy sleeves and Swarovski, Swarovski crystals surrounding the neckline. And I don't want to wear a wig, she said. I don't want to pretend I'm something I'm not. I took a deep breath when she said this. And besides, I think I look good this way. I thought back to all the times she had gained weight and would enthusiastically tell me, I mean, yes, I'm gained, I've gained weight, but I look really cute chubby. I smiled and held back my tears. I knew that I knew that I knew she wasn't replaceable. Accepting this truth would be a more difficult challenge. No wig, I said. Good. I think you look perfect exactly as you are. I tried to stop the tears again, but was feeling overwhelmed, so grateful and so overwhelmed. It's going to be okay, she said. You are going to be just fine. I love you so much, Matt. She grabbed a hold of me, and I buried my face in her neck. How would I ever let her go? How would I ever be okay again? She was the one dying, yet she cared for me, comforted me, as she always had. With one hand rubbing my back and the other wrapped around my neck, I realized she was saying goodbye. She held on to me in that closet, in her closet. What I couldn't have known at the time was that in just one year, I'd need her to hold me again as I came out of mine. She was everything to me. Show me how to live, show me, show me how to love, Show me how to die. Just show me, Trina. Show me everything. Yeah. Hey, thanks for that. As it turns out, uh, Trina's death did, her, her parting gift from this world to me was the courage, you know, to live honestly and to step outside. Of, of what I'd been doing for so many years. I was so tired, I was so exhausted, you know. And um, uh, so I wanna share one more uh, excerpt. I have these written, these little pieces of paper are a receipt from Starbucks. <laughs> They're not all sad, I promise, but this one is. Okay. Uh, oh, this isn't it. Darn it. There it is. So this is actually what happened. 
Uh, after her grade si graveside service, everyone who had gathered on the cemetery's lawn headed for their cars, including me. Just before getting in mine, I turned back her way. I wasn't finished. Something had been left undone. I hadn't said all I needed to say, so I shut the van door and made my way through the wet grass over to where she was. Tears streamed down my face as I stood before her grave. Yellow roses were her favorite. They were placed upon her casket. Inside, I knew she lay with a shaven head because she had decided against wearing a wig. I thought it was the bravest decision. I was so proud of her. I want to be myself, she had told us. I don't want to pretend. I was in awe of her courage, of her moxie to say to all of us, I have cancer. Let's not dress this up. Let's not pretend this hasn't been hard, and let's not for a second pretend that I'm not beautiful this way. She was herself, always. I wasn't sure I had ever been. I had guarded the truth of who I was for nearly three decades, protecting myself and others from what I thought would be too much for all of us. But the hiding, the lying, the pretending had been only too much for me, had taken its toll. And in this mask-wearing world of pretend, I had become hardened like leather. I stood before her casket, a ring of flowers creating a safe hoop around us. I couldn't let her float away without telling the truth to my greatest friend. I had always known Trina wouldn't be disappointed, so I was never hiding from her. I was hiding from myself. I was the disappointed one. One hour earlier during her funeral service, I sang the words, Let me love you until you learn to love yourself, that Neo song. I told everyone in attendance it was a message from Trina to them. It would be several years before discovering it had been a message from her to me. Let me love you until you learn to love yourself. A sweet soliloquy of permission to be, to live, to love. Tall, thin pine trees stood bearing witness as I offered what felt like my last rites. I should already have told you this, I said standing before her, even though I'm sure you already know. But I need to say it out loud, and I want you to be the first one I say it to, the first person I tell. I drew a deep breath and closed my eyes. Scenes from junior high, high school, and college floated through my brain. I saw a young boy who had tried hard to be something he could never be. I saw myself in the care of my perfect sister, dancing to the Bee Gees and watching her do her makeup. I knew what I knew, I suppose I always had. And then I found the strength to say the words I had never before spoken. I think I'm gay, Trina. I'm pretty sure that I am, and I don't know what to do. So, hey, thank you. That was a beginning for me, um, and then navigating the next uh, time in my life was, was complicated, uh, but I went through this time where I, I left home, I separated uh, from my wife, and I was still trying to figure out if it was actually true, you know, uh, because I had shut that side down, I'd never been with a man before, you know, I was just not sure, and I didn't have this group of people in my life kind of leading the way, guiding, or having those conversations. Even though I'd read so many books, there weren't a lot of books that, they were more books that I was reading about talking about how to be gay but not be gay. Yikes. It was not my favorite. And um, so anyway, um, I went through this time. I'm an AA guy, uh, an alcoholic, and uh, been in recovery since my sobriety date is, I celebrated in July uh, 28th, 2007, so 14 years sober. And um, I've learned through so much through AA and, and how, how to live differently and the 12 steps. If you're ever a part of them, you hear people say, the only step that's not about, or that's about drinking is step one. All the other 12 are about how to live and not be an asshole, <laughs> you know, so... Um, I had a sponsor, and I was talking with him through some of this stuff, just trying to figure out if I was gay, asking the question, all of that kind of stuff. And 
I just remember Kevin saying to me, I mean, I don't think it's really that hard to know. I mean, is it? I just, I've never wondered whether or not I was straight. I just kind of know, you know, and it was those kind of simple answers, just keep it simple, that kind of made sense to me. Um, where are we on time? Um, so I'm going to nix this next thing and, uh, and just move along. But so what... What happened for me, long story short, is I, I came out, or well, I processed through that whole thing. I was praying to God and saying things like, just show me. Would you just show me? I just need to know. Please just show me. And the only thing I felt in my head of God speaking was, show you what exactly? I mean, what is it that you don't know? I think you already know the answer to this. And so walking around with that knowledge and being able to say the words, I am a gay man, was huge for me. You know, I'd never done that before. And so I spent quite a few months in that space. I didn't go out and get a boyfriend. I didn't get on the apps. You know, I just kind of sat with this information while I was going through my divorce, whatever. So get divorced, and I meet this guy. This is a big part of the book. This is probably not seamless, but, you know, it's all good. So I met this guy, and um, uh, his name was Luke, and he's a big part of the book. And part of that subtitle says, Lost Love. Well, I'd never really truly loved somebody as my authentic self, and it was such a a glorious time in my life, you know, of meeting somebody. It was a soft place for me to land. Beautiful man, uh, really, really sweet. And we were together for two and a half years. You know, he's not the one I married. And, and lived together and we're doing life together. And I was just like, oh my God, I just, I, I was so happy. You know what I mean? It was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And, um, and there's a lot about Luke and our relationship, but there came a point during the, at the beginning of the pandemic, which happened to a lot of people, where uh, things got sideways and they just didn't work. And sometimes relationships don't work. It wasn't a good pairing as it turned out, but I'll never regret that relationship and what it provided for me. And we're still good friends today. But we broke up, and this is where things went really south for me, because what ended up happening was um, I lost my mind. I mean, <laughs> I'm like, I'm a recovery guy, so we, like, reach out for help all the time. And I'd always been pretty steady, even through my coming out, all that kind of stuff. But I'd never really truly loved somebody like that before. And so um, I, I didn't know. You know when you see a movie and you see somebody, like, losing their mind over somebody broke up that hard? That was me. And I didn't recognize myself. It was a very complicated time. So, so I decided to go on this road trip because I was already lonely. So why not go on a road trip for six weeks by yourself? This is where being an ENFP is stupid. Because you don't think, like other people would be like, what are you doing? And they did. I'm like, oh, it's going to be awesome. I don't mind driving alone. I don't mind alone time, except when you're grieving and heartbroken. But at any rate, I got in that damn car and started on my way and began writing through this process. Meanwhile, I have all these well-meaning friends that are saying, it's time to get on the apps. It's time to let yourself out. I had never really experienced the whole gay scene. I just kind of went straight from marriage into this one relationship and, and let yourself out and explore all that kind of stuff. My God, the apps. Anybody? Anybody done the apps? They are awful. <laughs> just terrible. So I'm going to read you a section so you don't think I'm just a depressor. Um, Hold on a second. Those apps just kicked my ass. Which one is it? Oh, here it is. Starbucks receipt was a miracle. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> For readers. Okay, here we go. I put my courage into practice and subscribed to a gay app called Scruff. Ever heard of it? <laughs> it's the stupidest name. But I was staying away from Grinder because I heard, you know, that I just didn't 
have the moxie for a grinder. And so I went with scruff, whatever. Um, though I'd never been on a dating app before, a couple of friends assured me that scruff wasn't nearly as spicy as other dating apps, uh, not like the ones that sent an alert if someone was 15 feet due east. Daniel had been telling me to get myself out there. Apps are a great way to meet people. Just be careful. Careful? Within minutes of subscribing, I learned that Scruff had the same pigeon homing device as the others, giving my coordinates to anyone who might be interested in a booty call. While perusing faces and shirtless torsos, I received a message from Malcolm. He was just seven miles away, y'all. He began our chat by telling me all the things he wanted to do to me. The letters NSA punctuated his message. I didn't know what this meant. I considered National Security Agency. <laughs> Perhaps Malcolm was a bodyguard like Kevin Costner. Maybe a kindergarten teacher or an assassin. Maybe NSA meant neutralized scruff amateur. Whatever it was, my mission to put myself out there had already been compromised and Malcolm could be at my Airbnb in seven minutes. I closed my blinds. <laughs> After giving myself a quick pep talk, this is nothing. You can totally do this. Remember that time you ate an earthworm for a dollar? <laughs> I dove back in. This time, I decided to stick with reading profiles of veritable who's who of gay Memphis men. This is when I was on my road trip. One guy in particular caught my attention. Along with his boy next door, good looks, was his title, ambassador. Scruff has an ambassador? and he lives in Memphis? Yahtzee. I was feeling lucky. My first go round and already I'd hit the jackpot. If Scruff had a chamber of commerce, its name was Kevin. I struck up a conversation with this man who had somehow managed to become the ambassador of Scruff, but how exactly? I imagined queer beauty, a queer beauty pageant and baby oil. Kevin looked harmless and kind. Also, he wasn't wearing a harness in his profile pic. And I figured if he tried to put me in a headlock, this former second place city champ wrestler would be just fine. I told him I was new to the apps and a little skittish. Have <laughs> I forget when I pick these sections that I'm actually going to have to say the words out loud. <laughs> have you received any unsolicited butthole pics yet? He asked, God, is this a thing? I thought to myself because I didn't bring my tripod. Kevin was funny, telling me how beautiful my children would be with seven mile away Malcolm. <laughs> oh, before our conversation was over, we decided to meet the following day at the French truck coffee shop downtown Memphis. Memphis looked better in the daylight, and Kevin was a cute gay nerd. It was instant friendship. We hit it off right from the get, talking about his doctoral program and innate sense of do-gooding. I had a feeling that if I lived in Memphis, we might be friends. Kevin was a native, and while sipping his coffee, he told me all the beautiful things about it while I told him about the hostel that I was staying in. It was not my favorite place in the world. I suppose everything in life has two sides, dark and light, baby oil and ambassadors, and to each his own. After a quick goodbye, I headed out for Dallas. An old college friend I hadn't seen in nearly 30 years was living there with his partner, I was excited about our reconnection and looked forward to being a part of their lives for a few days. Driving through Arkansas on I-70 was no different than heading up I-69 in Indiana. It was regular, a lot of fields, a few cows, and an overcast sky. But then just like that, I crossed the border into Texas and everything opened up. The fields had backed themselves away from the road and I could see sky all the way to the ground. Staring out the window, I felt a twinge of heartache, which was nothing new. Loneliness exists in the periphery of life. We busy ourselves in the day-to-day, -day, coffee dates with friends and planning our weekend getaways. But when the scenes of our lives back far enough away, when we finally take in the vastness of the landscape of our hearts, searching for the things we've lost is a natural response. On my trek to Dallas, I watched the dry ground like wall-to-wall -wall carpet running itself to the edge of the earth, connecting to the firmament that was both wall and ceiling simultaneously. Peering over the dashboard, I let myself imagine that little junior high boy who still lived inside me. 
I remembered how good he always meant to be. How sad he felt when he couldn't seem to turn himself into a real boy. I saw him being stripped of the things that made him who he was, who he desperately didn't want to be, a purposefully designed gay boy. He started running then, and three and a half decades later, I could still feel the pounding of his little feet against the walls of my heart. But in all of that running from, he had lost something central to his identity. If I stood still long enough, maybe he would pass me the baton, and instead of running from, I could run to for both of us. Maybe I was out there somewhere. Maybe I could be found. Maybe I was in Dallas. <clears throat> I've, um, hold on a second. Um, there, there's a lot to the story of which I can't, you know, tell all. Uh, but I, I will say this. I'm, I'm real proud of this book. I really am. And uh, for those of you who are looking for a good read, just a good, a good read that's meaningful, I hope you'll go check it out down there and maybe pick it up. But life is tough, isn't it? I, it really is. And it surprised me that I can't really do justice to the pain that I felt with the broken relationship of that first relationship. I can only to tell you that it, it cut me at the knees. It, it just shocked me that I'd never grieved like that in my life ever, you know, because I was committed, man. I was in it to win it, and I just didn't. When somebody receives you the, for the first time as you are, you know, oh God, it's just such a beautiful thing, and to have that ripped away, you have this feeling that you'll never ever be able to move on or find something that, like, again, that was your once and done, you know? And so, yes, life is complicated. But I'll tell you, I'm grateful for heartbreak today. I really am. Heartbreak can change us for the better. And for love, that can do just the same. It continues, heartbreak and love, to remind me that life really is worth living. So I want to thank you for being here. I'm going to go into a section. I didn't warn you about this before, so I'm going to ask you on the spot to find a question. My friend Laura is going to come up here for this, this Q. I just want to give you a minute to Q&A in our last few minutes together. If you have questions, whatever, you can ask anything you want. I'm going to take these off because you're blurry with them on. But uh, Laura wrote, is, she's my ride or die, you know, in life, and she was my friend through this whole trip. She proofed every chapter. She was the first one to read the book. She wrote the foreword to the book. She's also a writer. Her book is right next to mine. It's bright yellow. She wrote it down. How is, anybody? Somebody was nodding like they've seen it. Um, how a secret keeper became a storyteller. It's a beautiful book. If you haven't read Laura's writing, like, Hold on. I mean, I was nervous to let her do the forward for that reason. I was like, they're going to be like, this forward's amazing. The rest of this thing's crap. You know, but anyway, so uh, if, if you think of a question while we go through this first part, uh, feel free to, to shoot that out after we do this. Laura? Is it not working? Is this on? Oh, it's on. Hi. Well, hello. How are you, friend? Good, good. Um, well, I'm sure there's plenty of questions, but I was just thinking, because I was the one who was sitting over there with having a moment, um, and as someone who walked alongside you through that journey where I didn't recognize you, I know you said you didn't recognize yourself, but I didn't recognize you, and we talk 900 times a day, and all of a sudden I was like, this, this person's in a, a hole, and I don't even know how to reach them, and you know, three weeks ago yesterday, I was at your wedding, and it was, by the way, the happiest wedding I've ever been to in my life. I kind of don't want to get married, because I feel like <laughs> so the, the bar is pretty high. Um, and you're in such a different place, and, and it's like you've integrated all the parts of yourself over this past, however long, this past year. And so can you talk a little bit about 
just that time from where you were, you know, where you kind of left off in, in telling your story to where you are today, because they're vastly different places. Yeah, I, I spent some time in, in therapy uh, working with a guy named Dr. Palmer. He was an old man sitting in a basement, and when I first saw him, I was like, this man has nothing for me. You know, it turns out he was just amazing. But one of the things that he talked to me about is he said, do you, do you know and understand that love is, is transferable? And, I mean, it just the words make you stop a little bit, don't they? Uh, because I had thought one soulmate, that's it. You know, I'm going to have to take somebody who gets second place, whatever. And I said, explain that to me. And he said, well, everything that you have uh, within you that you brought to the table with Luke is that same thing is, is transferable. And you can bring that into other relationships with other people. So this love wasn't just something that you had with this one person. There are many people out there that you can love, and it really depends on what you bring to the table. You carried all of that love that you felt. It's the reason you were heartbroken. All of that love you felt was yours. It was yours. It wasn't just because of him or because of the two of you. It was what you decided to bring to the table. And so um, that was revelatory for me. I was still grieving, but it was like, an awakening for me that, okay, then I need to open myself back up that this is possible. Does that answer the question? Yep. It does? <laughs> it does, yeah. And so, oh, the, the tail end of that is, so I found Chris on Tinder, so much better than Scruff, but not much. And, and Chris, Chris was married for 23 years, has two boys. I'm married for 23 years, have two girls. And yeah, and he was supposed to be here. He was going to do this Q&A with me. He's so, you would love him. You would. He is the best guy ever. And that's just not newlywed shit talking. He really is. He's no, wonderful. No, I interviewed him. He's been cleared. He's been co -signed. True story. I was like, not an easy interview. We were like two weeks into this thing, and she was like, uh, we need a Zoom call where I bring all of my questions. And she did. There were 13. <laughs> One was about Dolly Parton. One was about Dolly Parton. It's true. And he answered it correctly. Um, so do you want to open it up to questions? Yeah, right there. Well, as you can imagine, it affected my family a lot. You know, um, everybody was shocked that I was gay in my family. But nobody outside of my family seemed very surprised. I don't wear this everywhere I go, by the way. <laughs> and this shirt is a whole lot looser when you stand up than when you sit down. I cannot wait to change clothes. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was powerful for them. And it's, it's when you realize that each person in this family has their own journey to go on. It's the first time you feel like your kids are sort of like, you're just like, dear God. So every single morning, I got on my knees and I prayed for them. Uh, because I knew, I felt like I was effing them up and I carried so much of the responsibility of that. But I had to remember that if there's a God out there, they belong to God. They are not mine, you know. So all I can do at this time in my life is be there for them, answer their questions, let them rage, you know, and also with, uh, with their mom. So, you know, this stuff takes time. This has been since 2017. I don't know where it'll be, you know, three years from now, 10 years from now. It may not be any different. But my oldest is here. I'm so glad that she is, and she's my buddy. And, uh, you know, we're working it out. Uh, but thank you for that question. My parents, my dad is deceased, and my mom uh, came to the wedding. Sure did. Okay? So I didn't think that she would. She is the, the sweetest, kindest, gentlest person you've ever met in your life. I mean, you would just adore her. But this, that's why I said be patient with people who are not affirming because they're trying to figure this out, and it takes time. She's 78 years old. You know, uh, which is weird because I'm only 33. So she was really old. That is strange. Well, math is hard. Math <laughs> is hard. Um, and, but his mom is reading his book. Yep. And his husband's mom 
bought rainbow socks is all I'm going to say. Oh, my gosh. She sure did. And she called me last week and said, I think every, in her little sweet voice, she knows nothing about gay, you guys, not anything. She was like, I think every evangelical needs to read this book. And I was like telling her before, do not read this book. Please. <laughs> Pretty please, you're going to see all these things about your son that you don't like. <laughs> There's language. I mean, my mother has never uttered a cuss word when, oh, anyway, that's another story. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. How did you transcend the fear of hell? Oh, I, I became affirming in my theology um, in about 2005. But I was planning to just go the distance with this. I was divorced in 2017, so 12 years there that I was already affirming and didn't believe any of that horse shit. Uh, so um, so it, it wasn't really an issue. I, there was nothing bad between me and God, like what's going to happen to me when I did this. I was just more um, trying to figure out if, if this was actually true. It's, it's really strange, and I tell people all the time when they're like, my son's gay or my daughter's gay, I'm like, if they're going to the church that I think they're going to, I'm like, get out of there, because you don't really realize that you have to have these other people around you that are brilliant people that are PhDs and MDivs and all that shit, and they see all of this theology in a way that we need to see it and don't really know how. Too, because we're, we're just surrounded by everybody's drank the Kool-Aid in this one group, and we don't even know that other world exists, so that's very, very important. I have two minutes. We probably have one or two more questions. Um, well, I, I, first, I wrote my first book. This is my second book that's published, uh, and it's over there, Finding God in the Ruins. Uh, it's about pain, how God redeems pain. Uh, they put that book out of print. Uh, I still have copies, haha. -ha. So, uh, but they put that book out of print because it was a Christian publisher. A shitty Christian publisher. Okay, I was waiting for that. Um, and so, my vocation has changed. You know, I ended up leading worship in a United Methodist church that was affirming for a few years, uh, but now it's life coaching and speaking and writing, that kind of stuff. Anybody else? Probably one minute left. Last question? Okay. I'm going to hang out up here for a while. I'm a hugger. You can come hug me. I'll give you a piggyback <laughs> ride. Whatever. So probably will. feel free to come up and say hello. Thank you so much. Thank you.